Thank you all for coming, and we have a wonderful extra surprise for you tonight. Our dear friend Ursuline Carson and her company is Siegfried are going to perform a series of songs from the period. So I hope you enjoy this. Thanks. I'd like to present a very short uh, concert of songs written by or recorded by just a few of the artists that we've seen in this wonderful film. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah me too. It's really, really great. Um, in fact, the first song is, um, well, I better look at my notes and so I can and then I can remember. Yes, All of No Man's Land is Ours. This song was written by James Reese Europe, and the lyrics are by Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake. And it's in the voice of a soldier returning home from World War I, and the first thing he does is to call up his sweetheart and say, Honey, I'm home. All of no man's land. Hello, Central. Hello, hurry. Give me 403. Hello, Mary. Hello, dearie. Yes. Yes, this is me. Just landed at the beer and found the telephone. We've been parted for a year. Thank God, at last I'm home. Now, I haven't time to talk a lot, but I really want to say, lovely sweet forget-me-not. I've only time to say all of the no man's land is ours, dear. Now that I've come back home to you, wedding bells in June, June all can tell. By the tuny tune, the victory's won, the war is over, the whole wide world is a reading clover. Then hand in hand, we'll stroll through the life year. Just think how happy we will be. I mean, we three. We'll pick a bungalow beneath the fragrant boughs, and I'll come home to you with the blooming flowers. All of the no man's land is ours, dear. All of the no man's land is ours, dear. Now I've come back home to you. A wedding bells in Judy tune, all content by the Judy tune. The victory's won, the war is over, the whole wide world is wreathed in clover. Then hand in hand, we'll stroll through life, dear. Just think how happy we will be. I mean, we three will pick a bungalow beneath the fragrant palms, and I'll come home to you with the blooming flowers. All of the no man's land is.
This song was also composed and recorded by the same team. And it asked the question, how well the soldiers will be able to reinsert themselves into their old lives once they've returned to the United States. How you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? How you gonna keep them away from Broadway, chasing around, painting the town? How you gonna keep them away from art? That's the mystery. jazz, pop, and much of any other kind of music that has come after that. This song was recorded in 1934, and I'm willing to bet that everybody here knows this song. So, if you feel like singing along, I invite you to do so. All right. Louis Armstrong, 1901. 
She was an artist who performed all over the world and she has, she is in the Guinness Book of World Records because she released material for seven decades. Yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, she worked with Cal Calloway, she worked with Louis Armstrong, and Duke Ellington had his first hit with her. It was Creole Love Call, I believe it was mentioned earlier. But I'd like to do one of her recordings that's been uh, covered by many, many artists since then. Artists like Dinah Washington, Etta James, and Shirley Horn. Maybe you know this one too. somewhere around the 30s, and it's been being re-recorded ever since. David Bowie recorded it in 1974, and as recently as 2014, there is a lovely young jazz singer, Cecile um, Lauren Salivant, who also recorded it. I hope you will like it as much as I do. Yeah. 
it was in her dance. All the boys were going wild over Cage's dancing style. When I wish I could shake it up, my sister Kate, she shivers like the cherry on a plate. My mama wanted to know last night oh, what makes the boys think Kate is so nice. I know she can share me and it's understood. I know that I'm late, but I'll be up to date when I can shape me like my sister Kate. Ah, uh -huh. shape me like my sister Kate. I wanna shape me like my sister Kate. You know she shivers like a jelly. A jelly on a plate of the boys in the neighborhood. I know she can share me and it's understood. I know I'm late, but I'll be up to date when I can share me like my sister Kate. Ah, ah, ah. Share me like my sister Kate. Oh yeah, share me like my sister Kate. you that it would be short so this brings us up to our last song and no concert about this era would ever be complete without an homage to the Queen <laughs> Judges on mon pays et Paris are but two mon cœur et ma semaine belle mais en quoi bon le nier c'est Paris, Paris, tout entier. Le voix un jour, c'est mon rêve joli. J'ai deux amours, mon pays et Paris. When I any questions you had about the film. Judy is a real pro at this and I'm trying to learn. So uh, if you have anything you'd like to ask us, please feel free. Before um, well, we start your questions or while you're thinking of questions, yes. I'd just like to let you know that if, if this is a movie that's burnt in your memory and you've just got to see it again, we've got them all for sale outside. But also you can, there is a <laughs> film companion book that was made, um, it came out just at the end of last year, and it's 83 pages, and it covers a lot that's in here, but lots of other new stuff, and it's got um, virtual reality, so there's, a, an app, um, there's an app on it that you just point your phone to, you download it, you point your phone to it, and you can see other um, clips on it as well. 
Um, so and and please take a postcard on your way out. You can put it up on your fridge. You know, just be like a nice, a nice little souvenir, bookmark, or or something. Um, but again, thank you so very much for for coming, and we're here to answer any questions that you might have. I mean, you can be anything about the film, about us, more or less, without being too too personal. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was a long, historic, it took 15 years to make this film. When we started it, there was very little research uh, that was available to us. Uh, a lot of the people who are interviewed in this film were uh, had just published or were in the process of writing the, their own research. So we were finding them as they came through Paris. We learned about them and, and we, we found that it was a fascinating subject. We'd never thought about doing anything like this, but once we learned that there was research going on, every time we could find someone, because they had no budget, find someone who was coming to Paris, we would get in touch with them and say, listen, would you contribute to our film? So all of these people in the film are 15 years older, and they look it now. <laughs> and they're all well known, and they're all respected scholars in their fields. And we, they gave us an education. It was like going to school uh, with these people who had studied and learned and were beginning to publish and wanted to put out the information and the things that they had found out. They told us the story, and we were very, very naive. We knew nothing when we started except Josephine. Richard Wright, maybe James Baldwin and Sidney Bechet. We knew that they'd been here, but we had no idea how it all fit together, and we had no knowledge at all of any of the artists that studied here. So it was a slow process of learning and putting the film together and taking it apart every time another person came in with some more information, putting it together, taking it apart, putting it together. So it wasn't a long flow, easy flow. It was a take it apart and look at it and put it back together again as we found new information. And uh, the reason we love the subject is that the music, Ursuline knows this, the music has always driven us towards the culture. We've always loved the music and we're so proud that Ursuline has joined us in this journey. It was a journey and the music got us started and, and that was the process. Um, the, the, this documentary that you see here, um, it actually just came out in 2016, but before that there were two series, there are two series of short films that came out um, a couple years before that, and that's how they actually started out, by making short films. So there are, there's um, a, a DVD series that you can get, just like a six minute piece on, piece on Sidney Bichet, another sh short piece on, um, Jos on Josephine, another short piece on the women artists, and that's how it actually how it started as educational pieces. And then, as as the, we were showing the film, or we were you know trying to get interested in the mostly in the educational field and the um, cultural venues, people kept asking us, um, "Well, when are we going to make a documentary?" Asking them, and she said, "When is this going to be a documentary?" So finally, there was so much um, footage, they they could just go back and get all kinds of fresh new things from the footage they already had and make this long documentary. So that's how that has come out. So it serves. Um, different um, publics and different um, um, purposes as well. And that's how we started working that's together right. from right. working on this film too, because they were working on it and I was doing my thing on the side and uh, we joined together and um, it was a film or a subject that was begging to be treated because as you saw, the, this history goes back a hundred years and further than that, but this we start here. Um, but it, no one had ever made it. Books were you know, being written a bit here and there, but um, to have a definitive film uh, meant that we could take it further and um, show, share it with so many more people. One of the things that's been uh, interesting to us is when we made the film, we had an American audience in mind because it was our culture, our, our, our story. But what's so amazing is that this film has appealed to French people very, very deeply. And tomorrow night we're screening it at another place that already over 180 people have registered to come and visit. It's the second time we'll be screening it there. Uh, it seems that no one, and again it was a naivety and a sort of a storytelling naivety, is that no one was uh, 
uh, has ever seen in France. French people have never learned in school or seen in France the collaboration between African Americans and, and uh, the colonial peoples from, from the other countries. And this is fascinating, uh, uh, it, fascinating to them. And uh, you often come up and say to us, why don't we learn about this in our in our schools, you know. Oh, they say this in America too, why don't we learn about this in our schools? But, and we can't answer them because, you know, it's like we're just beginning to learn and put out and, and discover this, this great collaboration, this great contribution that's been made by other cultures other than just white culture. So. And the screening tomorrow night is it's subtitled in French, thanks yeah. to the American Embassy. Yeah. Um, so that, so when we first showed the film there at the Fondation des états unis it was in English and we did one night for a more anglophone community. The next night was more francophone, and the francophone evening was 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 very very frustrating because there's there's so much here that you know I, I think that um, it just was it was overwhelming. So now we've got it we've got it French, French which is which is lovely. And in November we started taking it out to schools here in the French in Parisian region in the Paris region. And uh, like Joanne said, the, you know, the kids were just, you know, we filled up gymnasiums. And, and you know, I went out to, um, to, to classrooms. The teachers um, programmed it and had taught the kids. Um, they were studying it during, you know, part of their, their, as part of their curriculum. And they, they, they made presentations. So they, you know, they were like, the, these classes, they were, the kids were like maybe 12, 13, and they'd, get, they'd be in groups of three. And they would come and they'd present a part of the film back to me. It was just like the most amazing thing, and it, uh, um, so what we what we enjoyed about this, and we hope that everybody else enjoys, is, is just um, the opening up of a whole different chapter. Because the, the layers of history in France are so many that right. there's always something there's always something to learn here. Um. Not that I would um, stake my life on the, the figures, no. Um, That's a good question no, because there are... I don't. There, be, the, I w I'm going to say that there are upwards towards, in the upper 10,000, like towards... 10,000. There were thousands, there, that, but that came in and out. Um, yeah. There were, came, there were, uh, there was a pretty strong community here in the, in the 20s, but there were a lot of people that came like the artists and like mm -hmm. only had like scholarships to stay for a year or two and left. So there was a lot of movement. There were um, also um, families, <laughs> families <laughs> whose um, sons or or some daughters who had been who had participated in the war who came just to see the um, the the cemeteries or where their where their family was buried. So there, there was a lot of movement. There were people that went down to Marseille. There were people that. Um, uh, that moved around France visiting the different places because African Americans have been billeted all through the country. So there's a lot of people that are, have traced. And uh, But in the 20s, I don't have an exact number, but there were quite a few. One of the things I wanted to say that I think probably one of the problems about getting numbers is that there was a whole community of merchants and and, and shop owners and shopkeepers who never were documented that lived in the Montmartre area, you know, and that's a whole area I don't think has really been looked at before. It's, it's very hard to know how many people came in and stayed for two years or three years and then because things changed had to move on. So figures are hard. You get more realistic when you talk about the writers and artists because that's documented, but it's the undocumented people who followed to make a living. There was horrible segregation, brutal. Really? It was violent and brutal and terrible. It was Between African American. 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 White soldiers just would not fight with African Americans. And uh, W. E. Du Bois came over after the war and went through uh, the camps to just document what he knew was happening because there was there was there has been a lot written about this that was published in the African American press. Of course, white Americans didn't care or weren't even involved or didn't notice this because they didn't read that press, but there was communication in the press. And uh, what he found over here was the conditions were terrible, especially the, there, was mo there was more labor here than there were fighting soldiers. There were 200,000 African Americans came to Paris, or came to France in World War I. 44,000 fought, 
So that meant over 150,000 did all of the, the dirty work. And that was pretty bad. And then that, did that spill over when uh, the war ended and they were living as, as, uh, together? When they went back home? No. It was no, in, here. in Paris, as, as an American community, did African Americans congregate with white Americans in Paris? Or, or was there still this? No, in the 20s, that's, that's sort of when it, well, the soldiers went back home. Most of them, the white soldiers were offered the chance to study here and given a stipend if they could make it. Um, most of the black soldiers were stayed in France, were forced into more labor and went home after the war. But then some of the musicians came back. They had been soldiers before. I think there was more interaction between the races after, in the 20s. There was, people, yeah. um, like if you saw it. Filmed your, in the nightclubs, for example, right. you'd, you'd, and um, the writers did um, frequent each other. Um, there is a, for example, and, and they were influenced by by each other. But for example, in Hemingway's *The Sun Also Rises*, he there's a character in his book that's uh, modeled after Claude McKay. Um, so there was there was interaction, um, but there was a real understanding and recognition that their lives were very very different and the purpose for them being here were very different. Um, and it wasn't unusual for, for example, like right after the war, that there were altercations between the military or, you know, uh, or former soldiers and the African Americans that were still here, uh, that were here in Paris. So, uh, and that went relatively um, unchecked, but um, on, for the, for the French part, if there was any kind of, for example, the French created um, systems where they would close down cabarets that were known to discriminate against African Americans or other blacks. A movie like um, Birth of the Nation was outlawed here because it was, it created social unrest. So there were, there was a, a recognition that um, uh, th there was a great difference between the two of them and that there was a, um, there was interaction, but um, not not easy. It was a, it was uneasy and interaction, uh, but it it improved later, like in the fifties and sixties, um, when, uh, for example, the musicians um, interacted together and and both traveled and played together. But yeah. We're working on that one. That, that's, 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 that's exactly what we're working on a film about this, because there, the language was a problem. There were a lot of people who spoke, who came from the South, who spoke a smattering of, of, of French, you know, from the New Orleans area. But the, the communication between the colonial soldiers and the American, African-American soldiers, or even African-American soldiers and the French was limited because of the language. Now, the subtleties of that I can't address yet. Can you? <laughs> um, there, there would have been, um, they didn't travel in the same circles. For example, if the, the, with, with the African Americans in the 1920s, the Africans or the Caribbeans that they would have been in contact with, they, it would have been the, the question of where would they have met them. Mm. Um, the, many of the Africans that were here in the, in the 1920s, they were either intellectuals um, who were at the university or writers like we saw those with the negritude movement um, or they were um, yeah at that point they hadn't started there wasn't a labor force yet a, a strong labor force that came later on in the, in the 50s and 60s so um, there wasn't that much opportunity to, uh, for them to meet each other and and they had to go out of the way sort of like you saw Claude McKay went down to the south of France and that's where he would have met some but the, the opportunity wasn't there as it was later on outside of the intellectual community. I just want to say one thing. What was very interesting was when the, uh, the African-American soldiers here were treated uh, very kindly by the French public when they, the music really opened up the world to some kind of conversation, even though uh, they couldn't speak the same language. The music galvanized a certain quality in people. They were fascinated with this wonderful, wonderful music from America and uh, music opened them up to, to thinking about this and getting to know them. There, there are photographs of, uh, of, of children in the arms of wonderful 
uh, wonderful black Americans and, and wonderful things written about that, you know, kind, generous things. So there was that interaction going on. Before coming to France, there was almost not, no meetings be, uh, coming together of Africans, People. the Caribbeans, and African Americans. So France was the, was the place where all of them, they came together for the first time. Um, um, what was I going to say? Um, the African Americans were, saw themselves here, or they realized themselves that they had a whole different um, uh, in, uh, experience to live here. They were, with the freedom, with the opportunities to, to express themselves, that was where they were focused. And then when they actually did um, meet, you saw when they met Africans at the, at the exhibitions, um, that side of Africa was the first time they were really see seeing that. And there had been, like in the 20s, a call from um, Marcus Garvey, you know, back to Africa movement. But the real knowledge of Africa just wasn't there. And so that's why, you know, the artists were, were, were to use a modern term, blown away by it and felt, started seeing the, the connection. But their reason for being here was to express themselves first and within the context of the world that they were living in and the African um, uh, reality, they knew nothing, nothing of it at all whatsoever and no opportunities to actually even seek it out. And so the, the African Americans, they, like Jake said, you know, they, they felt that th there, was a, there was a different status. They had a, a much different status here um, than the Africans did and the French looked at them differently. So there's that regard, the different regard, and then and the way you bring that bring that forward, and then realizing that the Africans were treating somebody different, and it takes a long time to um, figure out how you deal with that. But again, the opportunities weren't as uh, as many as they would have been later on in the um, 50s, 60s. If you want to close, yeah. thank you. Well, everyone, thank you.